Hi, this is Jim Cunningham. We're going to talk about the second Trump term, estate taxes and you. So we have had a lot of stuff that's happened in the last 10 years in terms of tax law change. We're getting ready to, those laws are getting ready to sunset at the end of 2025. And what we're going to talk about is what's on the horizon, right? Are these tax laws going to sunset? Are they going to continue? What, what can we expect in the future? So What we're talking about is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 that was passed during the first Trump term, and that is set to expire by its own terms because it did not get 60 votes in the Senate. That is set to expire December uh, 31st of 2025. So we're recording this a couple of days after the election in November of 2024. And so if you're watching this and it's 2026, you might say, oh, well, that 2024, gee, what were you talking about? All the laws changed. Well, we're not there yet, so we don't know. This will be put up on YouTube, and if you're watching it, obviously it is on YouTube. Uh, but the question is, to what extent will the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act be extended? So that was that big tax act that reduced um, income taxes, reduced estate taxes. Again, that is set to sunset at the end of 10 years, which is at the end of 2025. Uh, will it be permanently uh, will there be permanent changes? So this will will this be implemented permanently? And that is part of the Republican uh, platform is to make this a permanent change. Will it be modified? Is it just going to be extended for another 10 years? Uh, so is it going to have to sunset again in another 10 years? So we're going to talk about uh, what the possible outcomes are and how to plan for this. And um, we're going to focus on what this election means for, for your estate tax bill, your family, and your legacy. So the focus is going to be on estate taxes. We will cover one, at the very end, we're going to cover something on California uh, propositions and uh, and housing is, is really what we're going to be talking about. So this is kind of a long term. If you have real estate investments in California, you might be thinking, does it make sense to move those investments out of California? What can you do? What are the rules uh, on that? And we'll cover that a little bit. So we got 17 lawyers in our firm. Uh, currently, we have office locations in Northern and Southern California. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have lots of content, over 200 videos, and uh, we go deep on a lot of different topics. So long-form content, most of these are an hour or so. I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. My lips are moving. Words are coming out of my mouth. This is not legal advice, okay? So don't listen to this and go do a bunch of stuff just because Jim said. This is great to learn, great to you know reach out to us if you need some help with your estate plan. But please, this is legal advice, so uh, you know, uh, listen to it at your own risk. So let's talk about the current law, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 and estate taxes. So what is going on? Well, first of all, what is a federal estate tax? So let's start from, I'm going to start from the very beginning. The federal estate tax is a tax on the transfer of wealth after a human being with a heartbeat dies. So when that human's heart stops beating, the brain activity ceases functioning, that's when a person's dead. You have a death certificate. There's a date on that death certificate. And then what we do is we go to the federal tax code. And we look at, well, how much did this person die with? What were their assets? And then what did they give during their lifetime? And then uh, if that those dollar amounts are over a certain amount, then taxes are due. And that is 40% tax over a certain threshold. So there's like a coupon that you get. And so you can, uh, and it's a very large number. You can pass 13.61 million free of estate tax, but anything above 13.61 million is taxed at 40%. And we're just talking federally. States have their own death tax. Some states have their own inheritance tax. So what we're talking here is strictly the federal estate tax, which is the federal death tax. You can think about it in that way. And so what that is, is there's a coupon where under current law, if you die, if this person dies in 2024, assuming no prior gifts, that person could leave 13.61 million to whomever free of estate tax. So it's a pretty big number. And the reality is most people, you know, don't have that much, but for those who do, this is, you know, you should pay attention to this or those who might have in the future. And we'll talk about that, uh, the sort of the future growth of wealth. Uh, th again, this applies to very large estates. The federal estate tax reduces wealth concentration and generates revenue by taxing large estates. So this is the stated purpose of the federal estate tax is frankly to redistribute wealth. So there's been talk about a wealth tax for the last few years. We already have one, it's called the federal estate tax. So if you die with a certain dollar amount, you gotta pay a percentage of, of assets over that amount, but that only happens at death. The federal gift tax, so what's the federal gift tax? You hear a lot about estate and you also hear about gift tax. The 
federal gift tax, the idea of the gift tax is to prevent avoidance of the estate tax by taxing large transfers or large gifts of property made during a person's lifetime. So if you say, gee, if I've got a $50 million estate and the exemption is 13 million, I'll just give away my 50 million while I'm alive. Problem solved. No gift, uh, no estate tax. Well, those gifts come back in when a person passes away and those are part of your estate. So uh, we used to not have a gift tax a long, long time ago, but you know, the government wised up to people um, making lifetime gifts. So uh, for 2024 and 2025, the maximum amount is a uh, tax is 40%. So that's the uh, federal estate tax. So it's a federal level. States have the ability to impose taxes. Uh, in addition to that, Washington has a 20% death tax. So each person in 2024 can give $18,000 per person per year. So per donee per year. So what that means is I can give $18,000 to you. I can give $18,000 to each of my three children. And that is not considered a gift or a reportable gift. Obviously, it's a gift, but for our purposes here, you're not having to file the uh, the federal gift tax return, the Form 709. In addition, I can uh, give away $13.61 million. Now, I would have to file a gift tax return, but still there's no tax paid. And uh, this assumes no prior, what we call deceased spouse uh, unused exemption. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, in, in one of the slides, but basically just broadly speaking, the number is very high. And this is kind of the, the point that I'm, that I'm trying to make. Couples can double up on this $18,000 um, exemption. So uh, I'm married. My wife and I could give our uh, a child 18. I could give 18,000. My wife could give 18,000, $36,000 with no requirement to file a gift tax return. Also, when a spouse passes away, again, we'll talk about this, the survivor of the two of those people, the surviving spouse can inherit this $13.61 million coupon. So on a, on, a high, on a broad level, if an estate is $13.61 million or less, no estate tax. And just to put this into context, uh, of the 2.8 million uh, estates that happened in 2023 in the United States, 0.14% paid an estate tax. So that's 4,000 out of 2.8 million. Very, very small number. If you're in this group of people, Congratulations. Uh, and really what we're talking about, this is really for you. This webinar is for you. So this is, you know, if you have a, a $500,000 estate, we're going to be talking about numbers that are so big, it, the estate tax doesn't apply to you. Capital gains tax applies. And we're going to cover that uh, briefly in our, in our materials here. In 2025, the federal government has released the new numbers that $18,000, that ability to give $18,000 tax free is going to 19. And the um, federal government I, I don't know why they don't just round up, but it's $13.99 million that can go uh, free of estate tax, just call it $14 million, uh, and it's 40% on amounts over that $14 million number. But, uh, well, let's, let's take a look at example here, alpha and basis management. So I want to introduce a concept to you, and this is, applies to um, all estates. Really, this affects smaller estates the most. And what I'm what I'm trying to um, explain to you is why it makes sense to have, when you pass away, it makes sense for a lot of people to have those assets, what we call includable in your gross estate. So all that means is it's subject to death tax, subject to that $13.61 million calculation. So let's look at Alpha. Alpha dies in 2024 at age 90 with an estate of 25 million. 13.61 of that, uh, 13.61 million of that estate passes free of estate tax. And the balance of 11 million and change is subject to a 40% tax at 4.5 million. So really not a bad deal. I mean, it's about 20% uh, across the board. Um, the, the purpose of this federal estate tax is to redistribute wealth. That is a stated purpose. So the government is going to take away from Alpha's family uh, about four and a half million dollars and put that to the federal treasury and go out and and spend the money or whatever the federal government does with it, right? Very important, the heirs don't pay the tax, the estate does. So Alpha's estate, so Alpha's executor actually ends up signing that return and paying the taxes. Those are due nine months after death. And if that $25 million is illiquid, let's say it's a big apartment building, you're gonna have a problem that those taxes are still owed. You can uh, enter into an installment agreement with the federal government to pay those taxes over about a 10 year period that those taxes have to be paid. So what we're talking about here is a $25 million estate. You got to pay 4.5 million in taxes within nine months. However, the heirs get what is called an adjusted cost basis. And this is what I mean by basis management. Cost basis is if you buy something for a dollar and sell it for $10, you have to pay tax on the profit. 
if that $10 asset is included in your estate, then your heirs can sell that $10 asset and not pay any capital gains tax. Now, that might be subject to estate tax, but there's no capital gains tax. So this is one of the things, I think it's a little bit more complex tax, um, uh, kind of nuts and bolts of taxes and, and a little bit more difficult concept to, to get your head around. But bear in mind that when a person passes away, assets that are included in the gross estate of a decedent, except for annuities and IRAs, those are a carve out, those assets get an adjusted cost basis and the capital gains tax bill is, is wiped away. This saves the heirs $9.2 million in capital gains tax. So if I was an heir, I would take the $4.5 million tax bill over the $9.2 million capital gains tax bill. So if Alpha had given away, like in 2023, if Alpha, well, let's say 2020, Alpha gave away um, these assets that are now worth $25 million and then the heirs sold them, uh, not only would that gift be included in Alpha's estate, right, come back into the estate because it was gifted, but uh, you'd be stuck with this capital gains tax bill. So very, very important to understand uh, basis management. This is a big part of our practice in in the real world is when a client comes in, certainly a married uh, couple, and we'll, we'll cover an example a little bit later, but when a married couple comes in, we're really concerned about basis management. So it's this estate taxes or death taxes versus uh, cost basis. So very, very important to understand. We have this in other materials on our YouTube page. I'd really encourage you to take a look at that. So who should be paying attention to the possible tax cuts and Jobs Act extension? Well, uh, let's, again, we're going to talk about federal estate tax. In 2011, we got what I call the Obama cake. And then in 2017, we got the Trump frosting. So the Obama cake was $5 million exemption and the Trump frosting was um, uh, an extra 5 million on top of that. Now, when a person makes a gift, you do not slice the cake, right? It comes off the bottom first. So it's a really weird way to eat a cake. So if you, if you have uh, you know a $15 million estate and you wanna give a million, you're giving that out of your Obama exemption first. You do not eat into the frosting until you've eaten all the cake. So it's not like you're slicing a cake sideways, but you're having to eat this cake from the bottom. So what does that mean? Well, if you give away a million bucks, you've now taken your $5 million Obama exemption and now you have 4 million. Again, these are adjusted for inflation, but in 2026, uh, unless there is a, a new law that's passed and we're gonna cover this, unless there's a new law passed, now your exemption is reduced by a million. So another way of looking at this is if you have a larger estate and you wanna take advantage of the Trump era uh, the 2017 uh, tax benefit, you have to make a gift of greater than 6,805,000. So you have to give a lot. And for a lot of people, they go, well, wait a minute, you know, my wife and I are married. We have a $20 million estate. I don't know. They don't want to give away more than 6.8 million. That is a fair, um, you know, that's, that's a, a, that's a fair way to look at it. I'm not going to disagree with that, but just understand that gifts have to be in excess of that Obama, that older exemption from 2011. Now, the, the exception to this is um, not really an exception, but just an extra thing in there. If you have a predeceased spouse and you filed for portability, that is when you file a Form 706 federal estate tax return and you inherit your deceased spouse's exemption, okay, that $13 million exemption, when you inherit that, that's just added on to everything else. And when you make a gift, you're making it out of that deceased spouse's unused exemption first. Little in the weeds, we cover this uh, quite in depth on our YouTube uh, channel, but just understand there's a, there's a complexity to this that I think a lot of people, when they look at this, certainly a lot of estate planning attorneys don't even know what I just described to you. Uh, I know because I talk to them and I train them. A lot of people just don't know this. So the question is, will the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act be extended, amended, or made permanent? Well, without a bill that originates in the House of Representatives that is passed by the Senate and signed by President Trump next year, right? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will sunset. Now, that the amount that you can pass tax free is going to is going to be reduced to about seven point two million. By the way, in the prior slide, when I had those exemptions at five million, those are indexed for inflation. So, if you see seven point two and you say, "Jim, you were mentioning five, and I get seven point two, what's going on?" That's the Obama, the twenty eleven Obama exemption with the inflation adjuster. So, if something cost five dollars in twenty eleven, it costs seven dollars and twenty cents now, and that's that's where that number comes from. Amounts over 7.2 million, and again, I'm estimating 7.2 million, that they haven't come out with this number, but probably will be around there. That is taxed at, at 45% on amounts over 7.2 million. And again, taxes are due, you gotta write that check to the treasury 
nine months after the date of death, and there is a 5% per month penalty for failure to, failure to pay or failure to file. So a very significant steep penalty. So let's look at Abel, who died December 31, 2024, with the $10 million estate. $13.99 million can pass, uh, actually it should be $13.61 million can pass tax-free. Uh, there's no estate tax paid, right? Because that $10 million is under that dollar amount. Baker dies on December 31, 2024 with a $20 million estate. Let's just say that was 2025. Um, the, uh, with the $20 million estate, you're going to pay $2.4 million in tax. Um, but if you wait till 2026, that's going to be $5.76 million in tax. So just understand if a person dies in 2025 versus 2026, those taxes are going to go up significantly, even though the assets are the same value. Right. So that's what I'm meaning by by estate taxes going up in 2026. So just bear in mind that uh, for people with a $20 million estate, you really should be thinking about doing something uh, before then. Right. So this is not something where you want to take a wait and see. And we'll we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So um, you're, this is a graph. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I like this graph a lot because it shows the historical estate tax exemption, the projected estate tax exemption. Right. And you see it dropping. So you see it dropping in 2026. This is if there's no new extension of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or, or no bill gets through the, the uh, Congress. The blue line is the estimated estate value. So here's, here's kind of the, the weird part of this is the estate tax, death tax exemptions go up at the rate of inflation. But what we find for a lot of our clients who are, are growing and accumulating wealth, their wealth actually grows a lot faster than inflation. So they're getting richer as time goes by. So that taxable portion of your estate grows and grows and grows. So it's very important. I, I realize you may be thinking, well, you know, uh, my life expectancy is a certain number of years and I have this much now and, and I may not have a taxable estate today. That is true. But, you know, fast forward 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you may have a taxable estate. And so there are things that you can do now to avoid payment of taxes in the future and preserve that wealth for your family. So stated another way is I would not necessarily think of where you're at now, you need to think about where you're going to be when you pass away, what your assets will be, and what the the tax structure will be when you pass away. And I think that's a proper way to look at it because there are a lot of things you can do now to reduce the tax bite and preserve that wealth for your family. We cover those planning strategies and other webinars, and we'll touch on them in, in this one as well. Well, let's look at Charlie and Delta. So this really answers the question, should you be doing anything? So Charlie and Delta are 55. They have a $6 million estate. So Charlie and Delta, um, they're not going to get a future inheritance, right? Maybe their parents have already passed away or they're just, there's not much there. They have a $2 million home in LA, which is, you know, either a nice condo or a modest home in LA, right? Everything's expensive. And I'm assuming a 4% annual increase. They have a stock portfolio of 2 million and an IRA 401k of 2 million. Now I'm assuming the stock portfolio and IRA portfolio will have a 7% annual uh, return. Both are going to contribute to their 401k. They're going to max out their 401k through age uh, 65 before retiring. And at 65, they're going to spend 300,000 in retirement. This is a very common. So a lot of our clients who come in to, to meet with us about estate planning, uh, this is a lot of our clients, quite frankly. I'll, now, Charlie and Delta are probably worried about running out of money, frankly, right? They're worried about, you know, can I afford to live in California in retirement? Again, we cover that in other webinars, but this is a very common, um, fact pattern that we see with our clients. Well, if you model this out, right, uh, at age 90, Charlie and Delta are going to have a $37 million estate. Now, I actually use chat GPT-4 on this one. I just, I put this all in there and then I check the math, okay? But here's here's the point I'm trying to drive home. In 2059, the $7 million exemption uh, is going to be up to $14 million. It could be higher, it could be lower. Taxes are for this is if there's no change in the law. Taxes are 45% over 14 million uh, or $10 million. So if Charlie and Delta both pass away and they don't do anything, so if let's say Delta survives, so Charlie passes away and Delta does not file for portability, which is would be a mistake in this case, uh, taxes are 45% over 14 million. It's about $10 million. So it's a lot of money. If Delta timely files for portability, she picks up a $28 million exemption. She doubles it in our example here. Uh, and taxes are 45% on amounts over 28 million or 4 million. So this is very, very important. So this is one thing I want you to, to, to be mindful of. If, you know, if we're talking about your parents, we might be talking about you, but a lot of people that watch this are talking about their parents or grandparents. When somebody dies, 
you, I hear this all the time. Don't do anything for a year. Don't do anything for five years. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. I would say not getting married, not selling the house. You know, that makes sense. Uh, but you do need to meet with your lawyer and you do need to meet with your CPA. So there's some things that Delta, let's say Charlie passes away first. Delta should file for portability because she's essentially doubling up on her estate tax exemption, saving the family $6 million. Um, that's just, uh, that, that's amazing. If the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is extended, the exemption is $28 million per person or $56 million per couple and taxes are zero. So on this one, this is a tough one. I will tell you, clients come in and they say, should I do anything to minimize estate taxes? Uh, there are some things that they, that they can do and we'll talk about those, but uh, I just want to walk you through this example. And the, what I'm trying to drive home is if you're Charlie and Delta, you know, if, you're, if, <laughs> if you are thinking about estate planning, Really, you do need to think about the future, how big your estate will be, and model this out. If this is what I have, this is my uh, uh, rate of return, this is my social security income, this really is the purview of the certified financial planner. But really think about this because I would say Charlie and Delta, the, I would say take a wait and see approach, see what happens in 2025 before you do any what we call advanced planning, right? So certainly make sure your estate plan, your living trust is, is on a solid foundation. Now let's look at Romeo and Sierra. Uh, by the way, I'm using these names. These are for aviation. These are NATO, um, the alphabet. So you don't say R or S when you're flying a plane. You say Romeo and Sierra. So that's where it comes from. So if you're a pilot, you probably recognize these names. Romeo and Sierra, 45. So they're 10 years younger than Charlie and Delta. They're going to have a $95 million estate. Look at that. That is the time value of money, people. That is the uh, compound interest, which um, Albert Einstein described as the seventh wonder of the world. Uh, they have a $6 million estate. Again, the exact same estate as Charlie and Delta, but they're 10 years younger, okay? So in 2069, when they pass away, the exemption 17 million, taxes are 45%, tax bills $35 million. If the surviving spouse timely files for portability, that cuts it down to 27 million. If the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is extended, it's still an $11 million tax bill. Romeo and Sierra really need to do planning they probably should start planning when they're 45. They should start planning now. So if you're a Romeo and Sierra, if you got a $6 million estate in your 40s, you need to think about planning now because it only gets more expensive as time goes by and the benefits are, are diminished as time goes by. So when clients call in, they say, we have a $6 million estate. Should we do any advanced, advanced planning, which is planning beyond a living trust? I would say yes. If you're young, if you're under 50, absolutely get started. If you're over 50, um, you know, maybe you can take a little bit of a wait and see at that sort of $6 million level. You know, does it make sense to wait and see? I would say if you have a taxable estate, this would be over 14 or 28 million, 14 million if you're a single person, 28 million if you're a married couple. Taking a hard wait and see approach does not make sense. The sooner you start, the more value for your family. Now, let's look at Lima and Mike. They're 65. They have a $30 million estate. They act, so they're not taking a hard wait and see where we're not going to do anything and wait and see, but they take some actions. And what do they do? They create a structure an estate planning structure that includes one or more irrevocable trusts, one or more LLCs uh, for the rental properties, but wait to fund the structure, which is making the gifts until later in 2025. So why these are complex plans. And if I know I went through that kind of fast, we cover this in other webinars, but there are some things that Lima and Mike can do and again, we're in November of 2024, they can do over the next year to tee up their estate so that whether the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is extended or not, they can make a decision. But frankly, even if it is extended, they would still want to do this type of planning. They would still be looking at this planning uh, anyway. So, But what I'm talking about in funding the structure is you create this LLC, which is a, uh, we've covered this in other webinars, but it's an entity that a lot of people hold real estate in, and then you get shares of the LLC. Well, Lima and Mike could create a, a Nevada dynasty trust. We'll talk about that and transfer some of the shares of the LLC into that dynasty trust to transfer that wealth from one generation to the next, but they control it. Okay. Now they don't get the economic benefit. Let's say they transfer 20%. They're getting a 20% uh, cut and in, in the, the, the return on their, on their uh, investment uh, because that's now going to the kids side of the ledger, right? But what they're able to do is they're able to transfer those assets to the children and still retain control. So this is part of the transfer of wealth from one generation to the next. Uh, these are very complex plans. Uh, I think it's a mistake to wait until late 2025 to start this. 
Uh, I will tell you that um, we have this big demographic shift. A lot of people who know this area of the law, lawyers, they're aging out, they're retiring just at the time when there's a, a surge in demand where people need these services. So I would say if you have a non-taxable estate, and this would be an estate uh, of 7 million to 14 million, uh, if you're if you're single or 14 to 28 million, if you're married, it may make sense to create a plan, but take an act, wait and see approach. So it might make sense if you are, you know, if you're a married couple with 20 million, it might make sense to start taking these steps, but but wait and see to actually fund uh, the plan. So what do Mike and Lima do? Well, they review and they update their revocable living trust to optimize for taxes. I will tell you, there has been a lot of activity in the last probably five years on how to structure a living trust to maximize tax benefits and asset protection. So we cover that in other webinars, but there's been a lot of development in the, in the living trust space. Uh, frankly, kind of a lot of technological advancement like there is in, in everything else. But what Mike and Lima do is they create an irrevocable life insurance trust, and they make $18,000 per person per donee gifts to the islet, meaning if they have three kids, they're, they can gift up to 18,000 times six, right? So that's whatever that is, 115,000, whatever the math is. And then the, I, the life insurance trust, uh, the trustee of the trust can buy a second to die life insurance policy. Now, why does this make sense? Because the money that goes into that life insurance policy, if it's within a life insurance trust, stays out of Mike and Lima's estate. If done properly, it also avoids capital gains tax and income tax. So unlike an annuity that has um, some negative income tax attributes, a life insurance policy, Mike and Lima, they pay on the life insurance policy. The death benefit is not subject to income tax. That is a huge tax savings. And I would say a lot of our practice is focused on minimizing income taxes as much as, as estate taxes, if not more than estate taxes. Uh, so that's one way to, um, to transfer wealth from one generation to the next in a very tax efficient manner. They also create an LLC structure that is what, what uh, is called a Wyoming close LLC. So it's a Wyoming LLC with some language in the operating agreement that gives uh, Mike and Lima significant asset protection as well as asset protection for their kids. They use that as a holding company for the shares of the other LLCs. So this Wyoming LLC is holding all of Mike and Lima's investments, maybe other LLC shares, and then they can make a gift of some of those Wyoming LLC shares to a Nevada dynasty trust with a Nevada trustee. And I know I'm going through this very fast and you go, Jim, I don't even understand what you just said. We cover this on a lot of other webinars, but I want to give you a flavor of, of the lift that Mike and Lima need to do before the end of 2025. This takes months, right? This may take six months to get this, this plan in place for a variety of reasons. It's not because the lawyers are slow, but you're dealing with insurance, right? You're dealing with lenders. A lot of times on real estate, you need to get the insurance and lender approval so that can kind of delay things. And um, I think waiting uh, until 2025, the end of 2025 to start this is a mistake. I think you can get started on this now, early 2025, and you can wait until the end of 2025 to sign that single document where you're transferring those shares from, from Mike and Lima to the uh, Nevada Dynasty Trust. So that's what Mike and Lima can do. This is for people with a $30 million estate and above. Uh, planning and paying attention matters because the estate tax exemption amount can change and it could potentially go down in the future. You know, it could go up, go down. Who knows who's going to be the president in four years? We have no idea. Families with substantial assets need proactive planning to protect their wealth and regular reviews of estate plans are essential as laws and thresholds evolve. Uh, I, and again, insider tip, lawyers are aging out just as the client demand for services is increasing. I cannot tell you the number of clients that reach out to us that say, Jim, I saw your video, uh, I saw your webinar, my attorney retired. They don't even have someone they can send me to because everyone's too busy. I mean, this, this is the world we're living in now when it comes to um, planning for, for wealthier families. So how, do we, how, do, how can Cunningham Legal help? Well, our attorneys specialize in strategies to minimize or avoid estate taxes through comprehensive estate planning, guidance on trusts and lifetime gifting, and ongoing plan reviews to adjust for tax law changes. And what we're doing here is we're providing peace of mind and preserving family wealth across generations. So think about the wealthy people you know in your life who maybe have an intergenerational inherited wealth. Typically, the people who made the money uh, or who are caring for the money really took proactive steps to make sure that it was preserved and not lost to taxes. So very, very important. Okay. So the exemption is 13.61 million. It is set to, this is the amount that you can leave tax-free in 2024, 13.61 million going to 13.99 million in 2025. After 2026, that drops to, we're estimating 7.2 million per person. So if, 
if you're a married couple, 14.4 million if you file for portability. And remember, under the Obama administration, that $5 million exemption is indexed to inflation. That's why we have these odd looking numbers. And it was doubled up during the Trump administration. So we started with 5 million plus um, an inflation bump with Obama. Then we got another 5 million under Trump in 2017 with the inflation bump. But what needs to happen? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is going to expire as the law is written in December 31, 2025. What needs to happen to extend that? Watch, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to stay informed. So you can just hit the subscribe button and please share it with your friends. So who controls the White House? The House and Senate matters a whole lot. So we're just coming out of uh, an election. We may have single party control of government. This makes for <laughs> significantly more rapid and efficient policymaking. So whether it's a Republican or Democrat, um, it can streamline the legislative process. It's what happened in 2017, although it did take until December of 2017 to get the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed. Uh, and that was almost a year after Trump was sworn in as president. So I think everything I, we're seeing in the news now is they're a lot more um, proactive uh, and they're not kind of looking around like, hey, where's you know, where's the bathroom and how do I make a sandwich in the White House? Uh, everyone's been there before they know they know what's going on. Uh, so I think uh, you know it, it will be quicker if there's single party control. Uh, but dissension within the Republican Party can close uh, can slow things down, and we saw that with uh, how many votes it took to elect a Speaker of the House with that razor thin majority in the House. Uh, extreme policymaking, single party control can be more likely to um, you know skew one way, left or right, and we're on a, on a cycle where it looks like it'll be skewing right. Uh, but there is a Senate filibuster. We're going to talk about that, uh, and that's why it's very important. Even if the the Republicans control the House of Representatives it still may be difficult to get um, legislation through the Senate, and we'll talk about why. Uh, reduce compromise, yeah. If you're in total control, you can just kind of run roughshod over um, over the opposition, again, with the, uh, with the exception of the Senate filibuster. So divided government tends to result in more compromise, uh, gridlock, and policy stalemate. Uh, the economy actually does better under a divided government. So statistically speaking, um, it, uh, it does better. It's just like historically for over the last hundred years, uh, we have covered that in other webinars. We're going to be covering that in a, in a webinar in a week. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you might've already seen it. Uh, but expiration of the tax cuts and jobs act becomes more likely with divided government. So as we're recording this, we, it looks like the, um, you know, Trump is going to be the next president. The Republicans are in control of the Senate, but not a huge majority. They don't have 60 votes. And it's really a toss up on the Democrats. Uh, it could go either way. So Democrats are, are Republican control of the House. If you're watching this and that's already been resolved, then this is uh, you know a little redundant. Uh, who controls the House of Representatives matters a whole lot. Uh, it's a really big deal. And I'm going to tell you why. Because tax laws under the U.S. Constitution can only start in the House of Representatives. So there are certain types of bills that can only originate a bill is a proposed law. It's not a bill like, hey, I'm going to send you a power bill from PG&E or SCE. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's a certain type of bill, right? Um, these are, are uh, taxing bills. And these are related to money and how the government spends money. The revenue bills deal with taxes so um, or how the government raises money. So you can have a spending bill. That's a little bit different. A revenue bill is how the government collects the taxes. And the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is an example of a bill that can only be introduced in the House of Representatives. Now, the House tends to represent the people more than the Senate, um, and because um, there's more senators, 435 House and members of the House of Representatives, 100 senators, and those House of Representatives are, are as we know, elected by a particular district, so they're more responsive, uh, in theory, to the to the people. Uh, but tariffs are example. You know, it's an example of the of the Trump plan is to impose tariffs. Those are our bills that originate in the House. It's tax, right? Um, and But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Spending bills decide on how the money's spent. Um, and although they can cut from either the House or the Senate, the House has the first say on a spending bill. So Senate, you should know, means old man in Latin. Senatus, Senex is the old man. It's the deliberative body. The Senate is the one that thinks carefully about the laws with the role on reviewing and improving the bills. So it's not just another um, you know, version of the House of Representatives. It has a really different um, role in our in our uh, constitutional government. So while the Senate can suggest changes and vote on revenue or spending bills, they can't start them. So 
if Trump has control, if the GOP has control of the Senate and the Democrats have control of the House, they can't start a tax bill in the Senate. Now, they can nudge somebody in the House of Representatives to bring that bill to the floor, but it's going to have to get enough support from uh, the party in control, quite frankly, in order to, to become law. So uh, stated another way is it matters a whole lot who controls the House, because if the Republicans control the House and the Senate and the presidency, they can run through legislation significantly faster, higher probability that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will be extended. Whether it's permanent or not, we're going to talk about that. So um, again, if Trump proposes to extend the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to 2017, the bill must be introduced in the House first, and thereafter the Senate can discuss and amend it, but the starting point's always the House and then following passage of a tax bill, it goes to the Senate for review. The Senate can say, hey, this looks great. We're going to pass it. It can suggest changes, even reject it. If the Senate changes the bill, the House and Senate um, need to agree on the same version before it can be moved to the president to become law. So it has to pass both houses. Um, again, revenue bills have to start in the House. What about the GOP-controlled Senate? So it looks like the Republicans are going to control the Senate. We have something called a filibuster. Now, you might have heard of this, and this is like maybe civics from high school, and I don't mean to bore you, but this is really important. The filibuster is when one or more senators keeps talking, right, uh, also known as deliberating, and refuses to stop talking, going on for hours or days. The senators can read a book, talk about completely unrelated topics, make long speeches, just stand up there and keep talking. Uh, it's less of a debate and more of a stalling tactic. And the filibuster can be used or block a vote uh, on a bill or a nomination. So um, the goal of the filibuster can be to stop, um, the, I'm going to put an asterisk on the nomination, so it depends on what we're talking about. The goal of a filibuster can be to stop a bill from passing, especially if the minority party, so in the case of Democrats, uh, don't have enough votes to defeat it outright. So if you have you know, 63 uh, Republican senators and 47 uh, Democrat senators or, or independents who caucus with uh, the, the Democrats, uh, they can filibuster. And they can uh, keep talking. And uh, we'll talk about how to end a filibuster in another slide. But if the GOP wants to extend the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the Democrats might use the filibuster to try and stop its passage uh, and stop the bill from coming to a vote by talking, just keeping talking for a long time. So a uh, filibuster is end by what is called a closure vote, not closure, but cloture, which is a special vote to end debate and move forward with the vote on a bill. This does require 60 uh, votes in the Senate. So to have 60 senators in one party is very powerful. It doesn't look like that the GOP is going to get 60 uh, senators. So um, you, how do you end a filibuster? You Maybe you modify the bill, right? And, and then you stop the filibuster. So if the Democrats want something in a, in a tax bill that the, the Republicans don't want, the, sen the Democrats keep filibustering until the Democrats get what they want. So it's a, it's a negotiation tactic. Um, and the minority party can, again, can try and weaken the bill or prevent it from passing. And this is really important when a bill is controversial or when the majority party only has a slim advantage in the Senate. So I would say that if you don't have, you know, 63 is not a huge advantage in the Senate. Um, and uh, again, you're probably seeing this on on TV with people who are significantly more, more versed in this than I am. Uh, but understand that from the passage aspect and how this relates to your estate taxes, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act sunsets December 31, 2025, unless a bill originates in the House, passes the Senate, and is signed by the President before December 31, 2025. So that's not that long from now. So let's assume the GOP gets control of the House and gets an extension of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed and sends, to the, sends it to the Senate. So let's assume the GOP is in control of the House, right? They get to uh, originate whatever they bill in the, they want in the House. They pass it. The Democrats oppose the bill but don't have enough to votes to defeat it. So they get stand up and start talking. Senator Schiff, who's going to be the new senator from California, stands up and talks for hours, even reading from a novel or giving a long speech. And if Senator Schiff talks long enough, the GOP will have to gather 60 votes to stop the filibuster and finally vote on the bill. And if Schiff and the other Democrats can keep the filibuster going and the GOP doesn't get 60 votes for closure, then the bill could be blocked uh, for a long, long time. Now, the exception is for judicial nominations and presidential appointments. Other nominations can be filibustered, but judicial nominations and presidential appointments, uh, the filibuster was eliminated in 2013 and 2017 under the uh, nudging of Harry Reid, who's a Democrat, uh, late, the late Harry Reid from Nevada. And this means a simple majority, just 51 votes, is now enough to confirm these nominations. So that's how we got 
um, those uh, the three Supreme Court justices confirmed under Trump and the one under uh, under Biden. It was a 51 vote. So those are the rules. Those are the filibuster rules. Does not apply to the Supreme Court or um, presidential appointments. So key takeaways, GOP is anticipated to keep control of the Senate. Don't know about the House of Representatives. And if the tax, if the Democrats control the House, the extension of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is less likely than if the GOP maintains a majority. And even if the GOP keeps the House, getting a bill passed in the Senate is not an easy task. Or getting a bill passed in the House is not an easy task because you may have some defectors. Uh, once passed the the in the Senate, the Democrats can um, can filibuster a bill and uh, keep it from passing. And I think it would be unwise to assume that because Trump has been reelected, that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has a 100% likelihood uh, or certainty of being extended. We simply don't know. And <laughs> this makes it very uncomfortable if you're watching this. You're like, Jim, this is ridiculous. Like, how come there can't be certainty in tax law? I'm just telling you the way it is. But if you have an estate of over 30 million, if you're married or over 15 million, if you're single, you really need to do this planning anyway. So whether it's now or later, the earlier you start, the more benefits it can have for your family. What is the Trump agenda for January 2025 to January 2029? Well, um, to make the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permanent, lower the corporate rate to 15%, uh, restore full deduction of the state and local tax uh, deduction. That was a, um, that is gives you the ability to deduct state and local taxes from your federal tax bill. Very important for high tax jurisdictions like California. Uh, repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, green energy tax credits. So that's a whole other uh, area that that we have covered in other webinars. Uh, create a tax deduction for auto loan interest, which is kind of interesting. 20% tariff on imports plus an additional 50% for China and expand the child tax credit uh, to 5,000. And the income tax exemptions, uh, exempt social security income from income tax, exempt overtime pay, tips, uh, from income and payroll tax and uh, exempt Americans abroad from income tax. So if you live abroad, not paying um, your federal income tax, I don't know how these are going to get paid for. Don't know if they're going to pass. I'm just putting those out there. Where I'm, the reason I'm putting them out there is these all require some form of political capital. So when you look at taxing dead people versus taxing people who are earning wages, um, we saw the result of the election. A lot of people are concerned about inflation and the economy uh, and immigration and it's a lot easier to tax dead people than it is to tax people who are living and working. So I don't know what to make of that. I'm not trying to prognosticate anything or predict. Uh, I'm just saying that it is not a certainty that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will be extended. Let's uh, finish it off with some California ballot initiatives. And I want to give you an insight on real estate and real estate taxation on these California ballot initiatives. So we had um, the ones I want to talk about. There were some spending bills um, for schools and other things. Those passed. Those have to come from the general fund, which means California is going to spend more money uh, to pay those bonds off, and that money will be invested in schools and other activities. And, uh, you know, again, it's a political topic, not really going to get into it, uh, but just know that those bond measures, really not talking about those because those don't affect what is something that is near and dear to my heart, which is Prop 13. So Prop 33 did not pass and Prop 5 did not pass. And I will relate this to Prop 13, uh, and, and you'll see here in just, just a moment. Um, you know, housing is largely unaffordable for many people in California, uh, for those people with significant wealth, you know, you, you can own a home, a second home. Uh, there are a lot of people that are in tenant occupied properties. And, and we have a graph here. Um, when you look at San Francisco and Oakland and Los Angeles County, a, a majority of the people are, are, do not own where they live. Other counties, uh, a majority of the people do own where they live. And um, two thirds of Californians face apartment rent of fifteen hundred dollars or more per month. So pr prices are going up, right? Wages have gone up, inflation's gone up. So where am I going with this? Well, Prop Thirty Three uh, did not pass, and that would have allowed local governments to impose their own rent control, right? So there, a no vote. Um, meant that state law would continue to prohibit cities and counties from enacting local rent control. So that did not pass. And what that means is state law still says that the state, you know, is, uh, is in charge of that local, local, um, counties and municipalities can't, uh, impose new rent control. So why is this on the ballot? 
Because when, when this came out, I thought, why is this on the ballot? We just passed statewide rent control. That's a little bit of a watered down version of rent, rent control when you look at San Francisco or Oakland or, or Los Angeles. And I'm, again, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying those are far more restrictive than the, the state rent control. But this expires January 1 of 2030. So if you own rental properties, uh, that's in five years, five years from now, this law expires. Pay attention because what is going to happen is there will probably be some other rent control initiatives or something on the ballot. So if you own rental properties and you're concerned about it, you need to pay attention to this because this state law that caps uh, rent increases is going away in 2030. So I would expect more initiatives uh, on the horizon on this, uh, not, not less. So this is just probably one of many. Now, Prop 5 reduced the voting threshold to basically increase property taxes from two-thirds to 55%. This did not pass, and this is something really to pay attention to because before Prop 13 was passed, the average tax rate for real estate in California was 2.67%. Right now, it's limited under the Constitution to 1%. So pay attention to this. So this, this did get votes. It didn't get enough to pass. But I think what the trend that, that I'm seeing in California is California, uh, the, the amount of revenue that that comes in from Prop 13 from these, and for some people, much significantly lower property taxes, the government is arguing it's just not enough money. Now, we can debate that the government spends too much, they tax too much, whatever it is, but pay attention to this because this is not the first time this is this issue has come up that, that uh, taxes where people want taxes to go up. The fact that you have a lot of people who are not homeowners, they would say, great, you know, increase property taxes on, on my landlord. It doesn't affect me directly. Uh, you know, of course it does because that means increased rent. But really pay attention to this because this, this would, be, would have been an erosion to Prop 13. So um, it had to pass by two-thirds. It did not pass. So I'm going to end. If you're thinking about selling California rental property, right, and a lot of people are for, for two big reasons. One is they might be leaving California. Secondly, is the amount of rent that you get in terms of, of income uh, can be higher outside of California. And some people say, gee, I'm going to sell my million dollar property in California and I'm going to 3x my, my um, income by moving to another state. So uh, I would just caution you on this. If you're thinking about selling your California rental property, think about, <laughs> this is kind of creepy, but think about waiting until the death of a spouse for that adjusted cost basis. So Married couple in California owning uh, properties, community property, one spouse dies, the surviving spouse can sell that property and not pay any capital gains tax. So that's a huge freebie, right? That, that's really important. Otherwise, um, if you're going to sell property, a lot of people do what is called the 1031 exchange. And again, we cover this in other webinars, but this is the ability to sell property and replace it with a replacement property on a tax-free basis. So you're not paying capital gains taxes when you sell that property and move it to another state. If you move that money from California to another state, you have to file um, or timely file a California form FTB 3840, which is the California like kind exchanges with the California Franchise Tax Board. And it's required for the tax year in which the exchange occurs and for each subsequent year until the deferred California sourced gain or loss is recognized. If you don't file this, California can treat that as a sale and charge you the taxes right? When they find out that you haven't filed it. So this is something really to think about. Now, a lot of people, when they move out of California, uh, if they do a tax deferred exchange from property outside of California, they may go to a CPA in Texas, right? So they've sold their California property and they do a tax deferred exchange into Texas. I can tell you that Texas CPA probably has no idea about this filing. So you're not in compliance if that's happened. Um, and that's just something really to pay attention to if you're doing a tax deferred exchange on property outside of California. Well, that brings us to the end of our content. And next up next week is what to expect after the election with the makeup of Congress, Senate, and White House. We are focusing on the financial aspect uh, of this. So uh, that's coming up next week uh, in really sort of the markets and which way we think the markets will be going. So focused more not on tax policy, but more on uh, investment returns. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we will open it up to questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube, keep watching because the next video is just going to magically roll up. Uh, and thanks for joining us.